We finished today the series that I started several weeks back called Deeper Faith. And the message this morning is called to boldly go. We want to end on a bold note. God has called us to a walk of deep faith. A lot of times we think that we need more faith, but in reality, what we need is just better faith. Because Jesus said, even the faith of a small grain of a mustard seed is enough. It just needs to be good faith. We need not more faith, but better faith. We need deeper faith. If you think about deeper faith, it's, it's kind of like uh, a faith that reaches down into deep places so that we can uh, depend on and rely on God no matter what the circumstances are around us. Even if the times are difficult, uh, even if we go through a dry season, if we've got deep faith, we can still hold on and cling to a God who is great and God is wonderful. Our faith can, can sometimes have problems. We can have a faith that gets contaminated with doubt. Last week we talked about doubt. Uh, how doubt enters into our lives. Even in the midst of a faith-filled prayer meeting, the disciples exercised doubt, didn't they? But yet, uh, God in his grace overcomes even our doubts. And we looked at that story where the, the man who had the, do- the, the boy with the demon in it, and, then, and uh, he said, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Even in the midst of our faith, sometimes we can have doubt, but God helps us even with that. Sometimes our faith can be shallow. But when we have a deep faith, even in bad circumstances, we can still be overcomers. I want to ask you a question this morning. What would your life be like if you had a deeper faith? Think about that for just a moment. How would your life be different than it is today if your faith was stronger than it is today? How would your life be any different? Would it be any different? Do you believe it's possible to have a stronger faith than what you have now? Do you believe it's possible to have a deeper faith than what you already have? I'm looking at stone lecterns. Would your life be any different? That's a good question to ask ourselves. How would our life be different if our faith was stronger? We've looked through the book of Acts and we've seen what a deeper faith did for the lives of the disciples. We've seen incredible things happening in their lives and in the ministries that they had because they had a deeper faith in the Lord. And as their faith grew deeper, the the work that God did through them became more and more incredible. So as you read through the book of Acts, you see this unfolding. You see this walk of faith in the life of the disciples and you see uh, their journey just become absolutely phenomenal. Great and incredible things happen in their lives. As we get to chapter 13, which is where we're going to uh, pick up the story today, Acts chapter 13, we see, um, we see it taken yet to another level of faith. Another level. And we constantly see this happening in the book of Acts. More and more uh, things are going on. Great things are happening as the people of God surrender themselves to the Lord and his power and let God work through them and do whatever God wants to do. We want to look today at um, Paul and Barnabas as they started out on their first missionary journey. And, And there's some things that we're going to learn from their life that will, I think will help us in our walk with God. So let's pick up uh, with the story in Acts chapter 13. We're going to read verses 1 through 3 and then uh, go from there. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me... Barnabas and Saul. Now, when we say Saul, that's also the Apostle Paul. But I'm just going to refer to him as Paul because we're all familiar with that name. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. I want to do a really quick recap on Paul just for a moment. So we can just kind of keep our minds fresh and know... Paul's story and how he fits in with what's going on here. 
Paul was a Pharisee. He was trained by one of the greatest, uh, most respected leaders in Israel, in Jerusalem, Gamaliel. And so Paul has had this strict training in the law. He's a, a, a strong man of God. But when he sees Christianity starting to take place and he sees people following Jesus and claiming that he is the Messiah, he can't somehow make that work in his own theology. And so when we first are introduced to Paul, he is standing, uh, holding the cloaks of those who are stoning Stephen, the first martyr in the church, and giving approval to what's going on. And ever since that moment, he began to go out uh, and persecute Christians, trying to bring an end to the church. And as he was traveling to Damascus, you know the story probably, he was met by Jesus on the road. We looked at that several weeks back. He was met by Jesus on the road. He was blinded by a great light. And the Lord told him, go to Damascus and wait there. And so he waited for three days. And three days later, a man named Ananias came and prayed for him, and he received his sight. He received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and God gave him a mission of reaching the lost for the kingdom of God. We talked about how great it was that Ananias had the faith to go and talk to a man who was a known terrorist and was out to murder Christians, and yet he, was, he had enough faith to go and pray for this guy. So uh, hats off to Ananias for being willing to do something courageous. So uh, Paul gets saved. He's completely transformed to a new person. And uh, we find out that he tries to stay in Damascus and preach the gospel, but he gets into so much trouble that people are trying to kill him. So he has to flee from Damascus, and he ends up going to Jerusalem. But even in Jerusalem, the disciples are afraid of him. And it was Barnabas who talked the disciples into even meeting with Paul to talk with him and hear his story, his conversion and transformation. So uh, Bar Barnabas is uh, a key person in Paul's life early on uh, who introduces him to the disciples. He gets into trouble in Jerusalem. And then they have to get rid of him and send him off to Tarsus. Tarsus is his hometown, so they're figuring at least he'll be safe there in his hometown. So they send him off to Tarsus. He keeps getting into trouble because he's, he's one of these radical guys. Radical. Have you ever met one of those radical Christians? That's, that's who he is. He's radical. He's, just, he's saved and transformed completely. And um, then uh, later on, uh, lots of time goes by, Barnabas ends up going to Antioch. And, because, and he goes there because he hears that Gentiles are getting saved. And when he gets to Antioch, he sees this great work going on. Gentiles are getting saved. And he remembers Paul. And he thinks, wait a minute. I remember a guy, and the Lord told this guy that he was going to be a minister to Gentiles. And so he goes to Tarsus, and he looks for Paul, and he brings him back to Antioch. And then Barnabas and Paul together work in Antioch, and they reach out to Jews and Gentiles alike and, and build a church. And for years, these guys are working together in this church, and God is doing great and mighty things. It looks like Paul and Barnabas have found their niche. I mean, they're in a place where God is working. Great things are happening. People are getting saved. The church is growing and expanding. Why would you want to leave something like that? Why would you leave when things are going so well? They're comfortable. They're happy. God is doing things. Sometimes we find ourselves in a place where we, we feel comfortable. We feel like we know what we're doing. We, we, uh, we're good at our job. We're good at our ministry. We're good at whatever it is that we're doing. And we've, we feel comfortable there. And we don't really want to upset things and move and go anywhere else. And that's kind of the situation that Paul and Barnabas are in because they're in a place where things are really going great. But just because things are really going great doesn't mean that's where you should always stay. And just because things are going bad doesn't mean that's a time for you to leave. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit tell us when to stay and when to go, where to go, and how long to be there. We need the Holy Spirit to direct us, to guide us, to lead us, and help us to make the right decisions. Now, this church that they're in is in a prayer meeting. 
a time of worship and prayer and fasting. And it's in this kind of atmosphere that God speaks to them and says, I want you to send Paul and Barnabas on a journey. I want to send them out to spread the message of salvation to places and people who have never heard it before. And so this church, uh, they, they agree that, yes, we've heard the voice of God. We believe that the Lord is commissioning you to go out. And so they laid hands on them. They prayed for them. They fasted some more. And then they sent Paul and Barnabas off on a journey. We're not going to take the time this morning to go through all of the things that they went through and, and what was going on. But let me just uh, cover a couple of highlights. Think, of, think about what was happening. Here they go. They take off on this journey and they sail to the island of Cyprus. There they meet the Roman uh, governor, the, the proconsul who is in charge of that island. And uh, they perform a miracle and the guy gets saved. When you, when you get the governor of the island saved, man, that's good. That's great, especially in the Roman Empire. And so this guy gets saved. They, they leave from Cyprus and they go back to Asia Minor, what is today modern Turkey. And they uh, planted brand new churches in cities all around, places like uh, Pisidian Antioch and Iconium, Lystra and Derbe. And one time while they were in Lystra, uh, Paul and Barnabas uh, were ministering there and Paul healed a guy and the crowds thought that they were gods. And they tried to worship them. And bow down to them. And so they had to like, you know, stop. No, don't worship us. It's, it's the Lord Jesus who does, does the work of healing. And the people tried to stone Paul. Well, they didn't try. They did stone him. They stoned him and thought he was dead and left him. But God protected him. Miraculous things happened. People were saved. People were healed. Brand new churches were started. And they went back through all of the towns a second time where they had start, planted churches and encouraged them and prayed for them. And, and they set things in order. And they went back to Antioch and their home church that had sent them out. And they gave a report and said, here's what happened. Here's what God did. All these wonderful and great things. And they all rejoiced together. So God did wonderful things. The church had great faith to let go of these two people because they were key leaders. When you let go of your key leaders, man, that's, that's an act of faith to say, okay, we're gonna let you guys go and uh, do what God has called you to do. But they, they had faith to do that. And Paul and Barnabas had faith to go themselves and to, and to go off on this journey where they didn't know what was gonna happen. Paul almost got killed. He was stoned and left for dead. So it was a dangerous journey, but they were willing to go because they knew the God they served. They had faith in him. They had trust in him. God said, go, and they said, yes, we will. Now, I think there's some things that you and I can learn from their experience that will help us to be better followers of Jesus. That's really what our goal should be anyways, to be a better follower of Jesus and to have a deeper faith. And so here are some things that I think are important for us to take note of. First of all, God will speak to us if we will listen. God will speak to us if we will listen. When God called Paul and Barnabas to go on this journey, it happened during a time when they were in worship. The church was worshiping, praying, and fasting together. This word worship that you see in the text in Acts uh, chapter 13, the word worship in classical Greek was a word that was used to refer to someone who did works, uh, um, they did public service at their own expense. Public service at their own expense. And that was the Greek, classical Greek word that's used in that sentence. In the scriptures, it's used a little bit differently. It's used to refer to the Levites and the priests and their service in the temple. That's worship. And then it's also used in the church to refer to any act of service that Christians render to God. And that can be anything from prayer to giving to sharing your faith. Anything you do for the kingdom is considered a work that you do for God. It's called worship. Worship. This word worship also means work. But in this atmosphere of prayer, uh, they heard God speaking to them. And here's the thing. Many of us think that worship and prayer is about us speaking to God. 
But what we need to understand is that it's not just about us speaking to God, it's about Him speaking to us. If we, if we don't take time in our prayer and our worship to hear from Him, then we haven't done everything that we're supposed to do. Because prayer is not only about us speaking. It is about us listening. It's about us receiving from him. God will speak to us if we will listen to him. If we will listen to him. God is calling us to do great things for him. And one of the great things that he calls us to do is pray. I like this quote from um, a Scottish preacher named Thomas Chalmers. He said, prayer does not enable us to do a greater work for God. Prayer is a greater work for God. Prayer is a greater work for God. God is calling all of us to pray and to worship and to seek him. And that is one of the works that we do. That is part of our worship. It is the work that God has called us to. Let me tell you something. Nothing great happens in the kingdom of God without prayer. I heard a, a, a real small amen. Nothing great happens in the kingdom of God without prayer. Amen. That's right. Nothing. I, if you want to see God do great and incredible things, it starts with prayer. It continues with prayer. And it ends with prayer. It has to be, uh, prayer has to follow through the whole thing. God wants to do great things. He desires to do great things through our church and through you yourself. But I'm telling you that it doesn't happen without prayer. Cannot happen without prayer. The importance of prayer cannot be overstated. These disciples and this church, in fact, gathered together to pray, and it was in that atmosphere that God did something transformational. You know, you and I huh, are, ought to be very grateful that this church prayed, that they heard the voice of God, because this was the first uh, missionary journey that intentionally went out to go and plant brand new churches in places where they had no church and needed to hear the gospel message, and they reached out to Gentile, believe, uh, Gentile people to bring them into the kingdom. You and I are all, or I'm guessing we're probably all Gentiles. I don't know if we have Jews in here today or not. But we're Gentiles who are now part of the kingdom of God and we owe it to these pioneers who were willing by faith to go out and start new churches. You know, there's another story that I want to talk to you about that's a little bit closer to home. You say, well, that was 2,000 years ago. Well, let's talk about 200 years ago. In this nation, in 1806, uh, there was a, at Williams College in, uh, in Massachusetts, there were some students who decided they wanted to get together and pray because they were concerned about the spiritual condition of their fellow students. Now think about this, 1806 is only 30 years after um, 1776 when we won our independence from England. So we were a brand new country. And... And these guys, they got together, they were ridiculed on campus, and so they had to leave campus for their prayer meetings, and they went out to the countryside to pray. And that's what they were doing twice a week, praying for all the fellow students. One day, when they were out there praying, they got caught in a rainstorm. And so they found shelter under a haystack. And uh, I've been trying to figure this out. I'm just not figuring this out. How do you take shelter under a haystack? Anyways, that's what they did. Because <laughs> my mind is different about, maybe haystacks were different back then. They took shelter under a haystack. And while it was raining, and they were sitting there praying and, and uh, talking, and they, they got to talking about um, foreign missions. There was no foreign missions movement in the United States at that time. But they, they had a, a, a feeling in their heart that they should pray about foreign missions and that they should pray for their fellow students to, to uh, have an awareness of foreign missions and be concerned about foreign missions. And so they were praying about this and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit spoke to their hearts and they realized that they themselves needed to have a heart for foreign missions. And so they all prayed for themselves to have a heart for missions and they all dedicated themselves to the Lord sitting there under that haystack praying together we're going to give ourselves to missions. 
Four years later, these, uh, some of those who were in that prayer meeting started the very first mission society in the United States. And two years after that, they sent their first missionaries to India. They sent missionaries to Palestine. They sent missionaries to Turkey, to Hawaii, to China. And, and the missions, and, and it, in 2006, there was even a 200-year celebration of the Haystack meeting that took place in 1806. That meeting was a simple prayer meeting of college students under a haystack that started missions in this nation. There was no missions program in the United States. We were not sending missionaries anywhere. It was these guys who started it and it came, it was birthed out of a prayer meeting. You understand this? Every great move of God begins with a prayer meeting. Think of all of the great revivals that have happened throughout time. How did they start? They started with a prayer meeting. You and I today uh, support missions around the world. And, and that wouldn't be happening if it hadn't been for somebody who started it. And it was these guys that started it in 1806. So the first point is God will speak to us if we will listen. God will speak to us if we will listen. The second thing I think we learn is this. God calls some people for a special service. And, and also, along with that, the church is responsible or privileged to partner with those who are called. Not everybody gets called into missions or full-time ministry. But all of us serve the Lord. And all of us have a part in what happens. And you think about Paul and Barnabas. Only Paul and Barnabas, well, and John Mark, went off uh, on this missions trip. The rest of the church stayed where they were. But if it hadn't been for that church, they wouldn't have been able to go. So we need to understand the importance of all of us being involved and supporting the work of those who are in ministry or those who are in missions. It's important. Now, you might be called to missions. You might be called to missions. You'll never know that, however, unless you pray. Because what was the first point? God will speak to us if we will listen to him. If you'll pray and ask the Lord and, and let him speak to your heart, you, know, you never know. One day he might call you to missions. And if that scares you, don't let it scare you. It's a privilege. It's an honor. But even if God doesn't call you to missions, God definitely calls you to support missions. To support missionaries. There are, there are a few things that you and I can do to support the work of missions. The first thing is this. We can pray for them. What was the first point? God will speak to you if you will listen. We can pray for missionaries. Um, let me read to you Colossians chapter 4 verses 12 and 13. Epaphras, one who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you. You see that? He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. A man who is wrestling in prayer is working hard. You see that? You catch that? When you and I pray for our missionaries, we are working hard for them. And they need our prayers. They covet your prayers. One of the things that you and I can do for missions, missionaries, is to pray for them. Every missionary needs somebody like Epaphras who is wrestling in prayer for them. Some of our missionaries are in dangerous places. Some of them are in places that we can't even disclose because if we let, it, if we let the word out, their lives would be in danger. So there are some of them are in dangerous places, but all of them are in places where they need the Lord's direction and discernment and wisdom. And you and I can pray for them, that God would help them in the efforts that they're putting forth. We want them to be fruitful. Not only can we pray for them, but we can give to help them. Many of you give to missions in this church, and I want you to know uh, how much I appreciate your willingness to be generous and give to support missions. 
every dollar that you give into missions in the offering, and you notice I don't have an offering envelope in front of me, but you see them in the, in the pew. There's a line there that says missions and an amount you can put for missions. Anything you designate on your envelope for missions goes to missions. We don't keep any of that. We send it all out and we make sure actually at the end of the year, December 31st, we look at the total that came in for missions and the total that went out. And if we're short, if we didn't give it all away, we give it all away. We want to make sure that missions, we give missions every dollar that you give. So every dollar you give to missions goes back into missions. It goes to a missionary or it goes to a missions project. It goes to something, either uh, foreign missions or, or home missions. It goes out. We, we don't keep that. We give it away. That doesn't go into this church. It doesn't stay here. I want you to know that. When you give to missions, you're helping people all around the world. And let me, let me tell you something. You're a partner with every missionary that we support. We support... I can't remember the exact number, somewhere around 13 or 14 different missionaries all around the globe, both in the United States, a couple in the United States, but most of them around the world in various continents. You and I, when we give to missions, and Jan and I give to missions every week, when we give to missions, you and I are partnering with them and any harvest that they have, we share in that victory. We share in that. We're a part of what they're doing because we've supported them with our prayers and we've supported them with our money. So I encourage you, if you are not giving to missions, I want to challenge you to do that. I, I don't get anything from it. This church doesn't get anything from it. But I still want to challenge you. If you're not giving to missions on a regular basis, ask the Holy Spirit, what should I be giving? And uh, I encourage you to do, start doing that. Put that in there for missions. Not only can we pray or give, but we can help. You can even help. I have said this before, and I'm a firm believer, that every Christian at some point during their lives ought to go on at least one missions trip somewhere in the world to help somebody else. Uh, it will, and I know it sounds cliche, it will change your life. It will change your life. Everybody says... But I'm telling you, it will make a dramatic impact in your life if you would leave here and go somewhere else and, and do missions, do something for somebody. You say, well, I don't speak any other languages and I'm not a, a, a minister. What, what am I going to do? Oh, there's so many things that you could do. So many things. You could help to uh, feed and clothe the poor. You could help... Uh, do kids ministry or puppets or something to help children. Uh, you could uh, help by building a church. I mean, there's just all kinds of things that missionaries need help with. And, and the missionaries are good at getting you involved in whatever they're, they're doing. And so they can get you helping out. Even if you don't know the language, you can be a help in another country to somebody else. And let me tell you what happens when you leave the United States and go somewhere else to help somebody else somewhere around the world, they notice your sacrifice. They realize, hey, this person flew all the way over here because they love Jesus. Maybe this Jesus is worth knowing. If they're willing to make that kind of sacrifice to come and share him with me, maybe I need to, maybe I need to know this Jesus. It makes a difference. So when you, when you sacrifice and you give of yourself to help somebody else, that other person is going to see that. They're going to know it. And not only are, is that person going to be blessed, but in, amazingly, they're going to bless you. They're going to bless you. You will be blessed and touched by them. They'll minister to you as well. So you and I can do Lots of things to help others. It, it, you might think that you, you can't really make much of a difference, but let me tell you that God takes whatever we offer and he multiplies it. You remember the story of the loaves and the, and the fish? The kid who showed up and said, hey, I don't have much, but I got my lunch. You can have it, Jesus. 
And Jesus took that small, seemingly insignificant lunch for a small child and he fed thousands of people with that little bit. I'm telling you that what you have to offer the kingdom might only be seed, but God takes that seed that you offer, your service, your time, your money, your effort, whatever you give into the kingdom, God takes it and he can multiply it and do incredible things with whatever you offer to the Lord. Believe it. You can make a huge difference in somebody else's life. I, and I tell you that from personal experience because honestly, let me say to you that when, when I went to Brazil last year, I felt like what good is it for me to go over there? What have I got to offer them? What can I do? You say, but you're a pastor. Surely you had, I, that's just how I felt though. I couldn't speak their language. I didn't know their culture. I just felt like I didn't have anything to offer them. But once I got down there and I was in their homes and I was praying for people and I was seeing them, uh, their lives and talking to them through interpreters and hearing what's going on, I began to see that the Lord was using me in spite of me, in spite of me. And I saw God do things in people's lives that, and I couldn't even speak to them. And yet God was working in their lives. And then God worked in my life. I'm telling you from experience, it's an amazing thing. An amazing thing. All right, the first thing is, if we, uh, it, God will speak to us if we will listen. The second thing is, God calls some into ministry, but he calls all of us to be involved. We're all a part of missions. The third thing is this. If we will trust God, he will do great things through us. If we will trust God, he will do great things for us, through us. I, I, I went to Brazil not believing that I had anything to offer, but yet I did trust the Lord. I said, Lord, I I'm, I'm, don't have anything to give, but I have myself. And if you can use this, then it's yours. If we will just have faith, and it doesn't have to be in missions work, it can be in any facet of life. If we will trust God, he will do great things through us. It's amazing what God can do with a person surrendered to him, with a person who is willing to be used by him. I asked you at the beginning of this message, how would your life be different if you had greater faith? What do you think God could do through you and in you if you simply had a little bit more faith? Look back through the pages of history and see the, the men and women in the scriptures that God touched and God used in incredible ways. Think about people like Abraham who left his home and his family and his, uh, everything he knew to go to a place where he wasn't even sure where he was going. <clears throat> the Lord just said, go to the land that I will show you. And so he just started walking and God just kept leading him to different, he had no idea where he was gonna end up or what was gonna happen, but he trusted God and God did great things through Abraham. Think about someone like Joseph. Can you imagine how he felt when he was betrayed by his own brothers and sold into slavery? And then as a slave was falsely accused of a crime he never committed, thrown into prison and forgotten? Sometimes we can feel like that in our lives, like we, uh, we have been rejected and forgotten. But even in that state, the Lord saw him. And, he, and we are reminded throughout the story that he still trusted the Lord. He still had faith in God. And in the end, God raised him up to a position that was the second highest position of power in the nation of Egypt. Why? Because he trusted the Lord. Think about Moses. Here was a man who shouldn't even be alive because the law said to kill all the, the, um, the boys that were born. But his mother had faith. She trusted God. And so she took her child and put him in a little basket and put him in the river and said, Lord, it's out of my hands, but it's in your hands. 
and then he ended up being rescued by someone in Pharaoh's own household, raised in Pharaoh's house. This is a, God had a, a great plan to use Moses. And then when Moses grew up and he, he learned the truth about his heritage and tried to correct things in his own power, he ended up making a mess out of it. On our own, we can make a big mess. And so he had to flee. He was a refugee, had to hide out in the desert. But 40 years later, God found him and said, Moses, I'm going to use you. He came up with every excuse in the book, but finally he agreed and said, I'll just trust you. I'll follow you. And as, as you watch Moses trusting God, I think his trust and his faith just grows more and more throughout his lifetime. And God did some of the most incredible things through a man who was willing to trust the Lord. Think about it, the deliverance. He led the greatest deliverance of refugees in history out of Egypt and into the promised land of Canaan. Wow. Wow. What about Elisha? He was a man who was working at his father's farm when Elijah uh, came by and said, God's calling you into the ministry. Come with me. And uh, he left everything. He left his farm. He left his family. He left his work to follow Elijah and trust the Lord. And God did incredible things through the life of Elisha. People were healed. Miracles occurred. Even raised, uh, people raised from the dead. Why? Because he trusted the Lord. Uh, you could just go on and on and on looking at the scriptures and all the different people that trusted God. Common, everyday people. Many of them common, everyday people. Not professional clergymen. Think about all the disciples. Think about that. Andrew and Peter and uh, John and James, fishermen on the coast of Galilee. They, they weren't seminary graduates. They weren't Levites. They weren't priests. They were just regular working Joes. I like that, working Joes. They were just the regular guys. But Jesus found them on the shore of Galilee and said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. They left everything and they said, well, I'll, okay, sure. We'll follow you, Jesus. And they did. Matthew was busy collecting taxes and Nathaniel was just sitting under a tree. I mean, these were just regular guys, regular people. All of them. But, but because they trusted the Lord, God did incredible things through them. What would God do in your life if you would just trust him? If you just had a deeper faith in him, if you were willing, willing to say, Lord, whatever you want for me, whatever you want from me, I'm willing to give that to you. What could happen in your life today? What could happen in your life next year or 10 years from now if you would just surrender and say, God, I'm tired of running it myself. I'm tired of, of making all my own plans. I, I'm, I'm surrendering to you and Lord, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'll do. I wanna close by reading a story. Uh, I just mentioned the disciples fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. Let's look at a story where Jesus called those fishermen. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, that's Peter, and asked him to put out a little from the shore then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So you got the scene. He's on the, the shore. He, he wants to speak to a larger crowd, and so he gets off the shore a little bit with this boat so that he can project his voice better. And so now he's sitting on this side of this boat, and he's teaching the people. That's Simon's boat. So Simon's in the boat with him. He had been fishing all night. You fished at night, so he had been fishing all night. He was repairing his nets from the, the day's work, and uh, he was done. He was finished. Verse 4, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Do you feel like that sometimes in your life? I've been working hard, God. You don't understand how hard I've been working. 
I have been working and I'm getting like nowhere. <laughs> You're asking me for more and I'm telling you I don't have more. I've got nothing else to give because I've already given it all out. I don't have anything else. I've been working hard. And I haven't really got anything to show for it, but I've been working hard. So he says that, but then he says, but because you say so, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Jesus, I've been working so hard for you and your kingdom. I've been doing so much. I've been spinning my wheels. I've been coming up with plans and I've been coming up with ideas and Lord, I just, but you know what? Because you said to do it. All right, I'll do it. Jesus said, go out into where? Deep waters. Deep waters. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so, so full that they began to sink. Working on his own, Peter had nothing to show for it. Working on his own, his nets came up empty. But when Jesus said, trust me and go out to deep waters and let down your nets, that act of obedience brought about an incredible harvest. It didn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense. He said, we've already fished. There's nothing there. We've already tried it. But Jesus says, let's do it again. This time, head out for that deep section right there. Just let your nets down. Just humor me. <laughs> Just do it. And I think sometimes God is speaking to us and he's saying, why don't you try, try it my way? Why don't you trust me? Why don't you go deep? Go deep. I believe the Lord wants you and I to have a deeper faith. I believe he wants us to trust him because he might be calling us to do something we've never done, to go someplace we've never gone to try something we've never tried. If it's, if it's our own plan, if it's our own scheme, our nets will come up empty. But if we're hearing the voice of the Lord, if we're hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit directing us and guiding us, I'm telling you that there is a harvest in store for us. There are blessings in store for us. The challenge for you and me is to simply listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, to surrender ourselves to Him and go where He says to go, to do what He says to do and not rely so much on our own plans, our own schemes, our own ideas and instead to rely on the voice of God to hear Him speaking to us. I believe if we'll do that, God will do great things through us. We'll see things we've never seen, experience things we've never experienced when we begin to trust God with a deeper faith. Let's stand up and let's pray.